Welcome everyone to today's session, Building a Foundational Folder Structure That Scales. Discuss the agenda shortly, but as a reminder, please feel free to submit any questions in the chat throughout today's session. Our experts are standing by and are here to help. For today's agenda, we'll provide guiding principles and design concepts to consider when strategizing and implementing a folder structure that meets your needs and requirements. Stick around for our customer spotlight where we'll hear how BTS developed and implemented a folder structure to support their security needs. And finally, we'll spend time at the close of today's session answering your questions live. My name is Haley Wolverton. I'm an implementation consultant with Box Consulting. I'm joined by my colleague, Milo Parsons, an information architecture lead at Box Consulting. We'll be joined later in today's session by Ranjit Pukatel, who is the IT director at BTS. We thank you all for joining. And with that, I'll hand it over to Milo to get things started. Thanks so much, Heidi. So I want to start off by saying two things. And trust me, they are related. Folder structures are really, really important and box is just like an airport. Now, I know it sounds crazy, maybe not as crazy as calling a game soccer where you kick people with a foot, but please hear me out. Bad folder structure design is like trying to catch a flight in an airport without any signs. Now, I want you to picture this. You're stuck in an Uber on the San Mateo Bridge with 30 minutes to catch your flight home from Oakland Airport to London. The sun is beaming down and you've dispelled all but a tiny bit of hope that you'll be able to make it. Now, after a while, the traffic jam clears and the Uber driver speeds along the highway to deliver you to the terminal with your bags in hand, your heart out of your chest and your stomach in the pits of despair. You arrive at the airport and now you've got to check in, drop your bags, go through security and frantically rush to your gate. And this is the exact story that happened to me. And the most surprising part of this story is that I made that flight with five minutes to spare. And I made it because of one thing, airport signs. Signs in airports are a lot like folder structures. They provide you with that context to help you understand where you are, where you need to go, and what else is available to you. Now imagine you're standing here like I was at Oakland with no time to think and the need to get to your gate. You'd be stressed and push for time, but you'd probably be able to find your way eventually, even if you missed your flight. Now, take away all the signs. <laughs> and I don't know about you, but even the sight of this fills me with dread. Signs are so important to help us navigate a world of information, especially in things like airports. And this is no different to Box, that instead of you know, starting with signs, we start with a good folder structure. Ultimately, whether you're in an airport or you're trying to find that critical sales deck in Box to nail your next pitch, with that well-developed navigation system, you're not going to know where to go. If you don't find what you're looking for, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you missed opportunities from presenting the wrong thing. And you just might vow never to use that thing again. You might vow to use an alternative airport. But if you think about this in terms of, you know, IT or inbox, it might be users might be using shadow IT. They might look to use email. They might look to use other tools, other tools that have not been sanctioned and approved and potentially pose a risk because they haven't been configured in the right way. What I'm trying to say is essentially we would be lost without directions in the real world. It sounds so far fetched, doesn't it? To have an airport without signs. So please don't let your users be lost in box. But don't worry, help is at hand. And we're here today to take you through some th things to think about, some examples, uh, and as Haley said, some, some interviews at, at the end with, uh, with Ranji. So now I'm gonna pass over to Haley to take you through some more reasons why a well-designed folder structure is so, so crucial. Thanks, Milo. And like you mentioned, folder structures are important. Organizations understand the importance of data management, yet most are not doing enough to prepare for future data challenges. From an IDC survey of IT leaders, 80% agreed that content sprawl was one of their most critical problems, and 44% predicted the devastating impact if left unmanaged. Despite recognizing there's a problem, companies struggle to design solutions to address their needs, and that lack of proper planning and follow-through can result in a variety of issues, including a decrease in users' productivity due to content that's difficult to find, an increase to content sprawl due to the duplication of content, and also heightened risk, uh, like Milo mentioned, of that content that's not properly secured. But there's hope. Organizations do need strategies for effective content management that's built for the business user, accommodates shared workspaces that scale over time, and enforces your security, legal, and compliance requirements. So what are the best practices when designing a folder structure? Well, let's think back to the airport example shared by Milo. Users need a nav navigation system to help them answer three questions. Where am I? For example, am I in the right terminal? 
or is this the right folder? Where is the information I want? Where is my gate? How do I get to where I'm going? Um, or alternatively, where's the file I'm looking for? What else is available to me? Is, am I able to grab snacks along the way? Uh, what other resources are available to me in my box instance? If users can't answer any of these questions, you ultimately increase your risk for issues to arise. So how do we develop a folder structure that is considerate of your users' needs? We at Box recommend a three-step methodology to organize content for the optimal user experience. I'll go over each step and we'll cover them in more detail shortly. But first, in step one, understand your users, where the focus is on defining specific user requirements when considering the folder structure design. For step two, when we define the problem, what are some of the challenges that those users face today that we can look to solve for in a solution moving forward? And finally, step three for ID8 and design, where we encourage building an initial design that can be socialized amongst your stakeholders and validated as a viable solution prior to implementation. I'll pass it over to Milo, who will talk more in depth about step one. So, first step, as Haley said, understanding your users, but what do we mean by this? So, Let's start off with, uh, with a question. Which of these do you think are users? And I'll give you five seconds to, to think about it. Now, obviously, this is a trick question. They are all users, whether that's the marketing assistant, the contracts app, or the box admin. Every single one of these is a user. We define uh, a user in box essentially as anything that is interacting with content in Box. Now, when we consider folder structures, there really are three key types of users in Box when we think about this design. And those are users, admins, and systems. And oftentimes we focus on one or two of these, but neglect the others. So we might focus on the user and admin, but not think about how the system wants it designed. So it's really important that we incorporate all three of these. A user is somebody who wants access to content in Box. Your typical you know, standard user is your managed user, as it mentions there. Your external user is your, your user you're collaborating with, and your app user is a uh, user interacting with it via a portal, for example, or a particular integration. The admin, that's going to be some of you, right? It's responsible, the admin is responsible for the governing box and performing the admin functions like managing the user onboarding, running reports, and overseeing content structures. And here's when we introduce the things that, you know, issues can arise. So a folder structure can be, for example, designed it's easy for users to navigate, but not really easy for users to admins, uh, sorry, not really easy for admins to build out uh, or scale in an easy way. And lastly, the system. The system typically interacts with Box by the API. They don't see signposting. They don't benefit from the visual elements that users uh, benefit from by the UI. What they do benefit from is simplicity. Take an example of performing a call on a folder with, say, a million items. Probably not best to do that on that bigger folder. It's going to be much more efficient to do this on a smaller folder that's been further split out. And Haley will go through this in a bit more detail later on. When thinking about users, it's important to do more than just think about their roles. And this is a kind of a typical framework we look into. And that's essentially about defining the role, understanding their processes and goals, and then taking their user story and figuring out what, what the value is um, in, in you know, what they do in Box. And this is just an example of how you can break down those personas and write them up to allow you to understand all of those things. When we take the first one, for example, the sales manager, the process and goals, they want to manage all vendor and customer relations. And then the user story is, as a sales manager, I want to work with vendors so that I can secure more deals. So we understand the, the notion and the value in terms of why they want to be more efficient. And we understand that their importance and what they need in boxes to be more efficient. So we can factor that into the design, add in some automation, make things a lot easier for them. So when you think about designing a structure, design one based on user personas, including goals, et cetera, so that the user experience is both aligned to key and real processes. There's no point just taking a folder structure and not aligning it. It has to be aligned to real processes that is as easy to use and, and you know, as usable as possible. So Milo's talked about defining the use cases, the processes and goals for your user personas. Now, how do we go to step two to define the problem? When addressing each user persona, we recommend asking discovery questions that can surface problem areas that should be considered when creating that folder structure design. As you transition to Box, it's important to ensure that poor practices and inefficient workflows from previous content management systems are not repeated. Some examples of questions you may ask are, what are the priorities for the user persona? 
For example, do they want a single source of truth for their content in a centralized location? What are their challenges? Do they struggle with version conflicts or file versions being lost in endless email chains? I know that I have experienced that in the past. And what compels them to use Box? Is it the hope of simplifying sharing with internal and external parties? And obviously these are just examples, but for each response to these questions, think how will these impact our design? Step three in the framework is ideate and design. When designing a folder structure, it's really important to use tools to aid with both design and testing and the building. So for the initial design, a whiteboard or whiteboarding tool, for example, nowadays like Lucidchart, allows you to collaboratively draw up those ideas for structures and uncover considerations like access and settings. A card sorting is traditionally used for designing things like menus and websites, but it can also help you validate your folder structure design. Once you have an idea for developing folders, you can ask your users to group them into structures that make sense for them. And once you have a rough consensus, you know that that design is probably the way to go. Usability testing isn't always needed, but it can be very useful to further test your design. Doing things like asking users, can you find X? Show me how you navigate to this particular folder. If they struggle, you might need to rework the design or potentially think about how you, you know, might want to rework the enablement plan. Now, there are many tools available, but we firmly believe that these three are the key ones that, that help with the design. So now we've explained the framework, we're going to spotlight a few different things now. So we're not saying that these are the only things you should care about, but we believe if you have a focus on usability, scalability and security, you're going to know you have covered a lot of important areas. Each of these few sections will follow the same framework pattern we've just discussed, so that's understanding your users, defining the problem and designing the structure. And we'll also include an example to help you visualize everything. So usability. And what we're looking to do here again is to use the previous step in the framework to inform the next. When we have a focus on usability, the processing goals might be to seamlessly collaborate and share, or somebody might want to reduce the time spent on asset approvals. And the important thing here is when we're thinking about processes and goals, we've also got to think about the pain points. And this persona, when they're focused on usability, they struggle to find content. So we're going to need to find a way around that. Building upon the user personas and processes and goals, some of the questions we might use to help, us solve, uh, help solve the problem and inform our design, again, they're going to revolve around usability. How can we increase the findability of content? How can we reduce the errors that users are uh, you know, having when performing tasks? And ultimately, how can we improve the uh, user satisfaction they have when they access this content in box? And then the last stage, idea and design, we've got three key focus points based on the personas and problems. Findability, again, this is the ease at which users can find content. And for this, we recommend cascading metadata. What we're doing here essentially is applying that additional context to that content in box in a more automated and streamlined way. So we're applying that metadata at a folder level and having it cascade down to all of the subfolders and content beneath it. The important thing here is they're still getting the benefits the users they are allowed, are allowed to search, for example. Systems can still pick up the context from the, that content by metadata. But we're reducing the user friction because we're not having the user manually input that data. Automation is another uh, key focus point for design. And what we're doing here is focusing on the asset approval use case or that third party sharing uh, um, scenario that the user persona mentioned. So here we might create a centralized folder to allow for a single file request link to be used. And this would allow users to upload content to a unique URL. And we could then have a relay workflow, for example, pick up that content and move it to different folders based on metadata. And this again, would refer it back to understanding your users, would allow us to kick off that approval process that is so important for that persona. And lastly, is the information strategy. And this is not entirely related to Box. But what this is about is about informing your users on what goes where. This helps them essentially correctly store information, but also understand where to retrieve it. What we're thinking here is, for example, your content goes in box, documentation goes in Confluence, and Q&A goes in Slack. Now, after you do that, users are gonna know uh, how to easily find content based on the type of information they want to retrieve, but they're also gonna know where to store content. And that saves time, it makes them more efficient because they're not having to frantically search across different systems to find the content they need. And the beauty of all of this is that you could map that strategy to integrations with Box. So Box would integrate with these, uh, so you're essentially you know, still storing and collaborating on that content in one place, 
but the final versions are exposed in other systems like Confluence and, and Slack. And for the example for usability, we want to focus on cascading metadata. And here's an example of how cascading metadata might be used. So what we have here on the right is the marketing root folder with the cascading metadata being project campaign type digital. The key thing to think about here, especially when using cascading metadata, is that you want to group content together to ensure that the cascade policy is easy to apply. So you should separate out key categories like projects or asset types, but also, more importantly, think about the end goal. How is this metadata going to be used? Is it going to be used by a user or a system? You're also going to need to cascade more wide ranging metadata. And what I mean by this is types of projects, for example, instead of specific dates or supply numbers. And this just makes it easier to apply at a higher level and cascade down to more content. Users can still add in that, that manual you know, dates and supplier numbers later on, but we're just automating the bulk of the work and making them more efficient. Now, all of this with cascading metadata allows you to power that context related searching box. And you can apply this metadata to multiple different structures to allow for that content to reside in the place it should be, but empower users to collate content from these various different areas at once. For example, information around a particular customer it could be in marketing, it could be in sales, it could be in customer success. And with metadata, if they're all tackled the same thing, you can retrieve all results from all different areas. And with this, users are no longer going to have to navigate to the content. You're powering that discoverability we mentioned previously. So design a structure to assist usability by making users less prone to error and more likely to understand where content should be placed. So with a spotlight on scale, one thing to keep in mind is that Box is optimized for distributed content and collaboration. When designing a folder structure, consider not only your initial design, but also ensure that you can achieve massive scale over time with reduced risk of content sprawl. You may only have one use case in box or only a few seats, but you'll still want a solid foundation to be set from the start so that not to slow you down in the future as you continue to grow. Scale is important when understanding your users' goals for building workspaces for collaborative or individual use and defining who needs access to what. Also keep in mind how much content is expected to be stored and if there are ways in which content can be logically segmented. So when considering scale, during your ideate and design stage, take what you've learned from your user personas and map out your strategies for segmentation, ownership, and access. Remember, content in Box is owned by one user, wherein other users and our groups can be granted access to that content with an associated permission level. Access to content in Box does flow down from the point of invitation like a waterfall. Therefore, consider ways to logically segment your content when creating your design so as to grant users access only to that which is relevant to their day-to-day -day work. So if we wanted to highlight segmentation, consider how to logically uh, group your content in box so that it's easy to find at the user level while also supporting future use cases over time without a need to reconfigure the design. For the example on the right hand side, I've created a root level folder for my finance department within which I've created business areas um, as subfolders as accounts payable. Um, they each have their designated workspace. During the ID and design stage, I've encouraged my finance team to identify other opportunities to segment their content by relevant attributes, such as time, which they've built into the underlying structure by organizing invoices by year. So when implementing your structure, follow the box best practice as well to make sure naming conventions follow some kind of traceable logic. A folder's name should clearly identify the contents of that folder and what they represent, as users can be granted access to content in Box at varying levels of a hierarchy. So ideally, when logging into Box, users should know where they are and where the information they're looking for is located. So in summary, design a structure with scale and searchability in mind to ensure that user experience is efficient when logging into Box and locating the information that they're looking for. For Spotlight on security and compliance, Box's built-in security and compliance controls help to keep your data secure without sacrificing the user's ability to do their mission-critical work. We recommend conferring with your organization's security, compliance, and legal teams to document any internal security protocols and workflows that should be considered as it relates to your folder structure design. Similar to Milo's highlight on Box metadata, several security and compliance features in Box can be applied via a folder cascade. So it's important to map out an effective
effective way to comply with those requirements at scale. The most crucial and universally applicable area to, be, to consider are your box settings, which can be configured to secure your content at a global folder and file level. Folder level settings should be used to downscope functionality that's available at the global level. Let's take, for example, your organization who permits external collaboration globally. However, folder settings may be applied to restrict external collaboration for particularly sensitive workspaces where access is granted to internal users only. Keep in mind that folder settings do cascade to underlying structures within that folder, so it's important to keep that in mind as you build out your design. Additional security controls to consider are the ability to classify content based on its sensitivity using box shield classifications. Classifications can be applied at scale using the folder cascade, which I'll speak to in more detail shortly. Also with box governance, retention policies um, enable you to retain certain types of content in box for a specified period of time, and also to remove content from box that's no longer relevant to your needs. Retention policies facilitate content lifecycle management and can be applied to both metadata and to folders. So consider how content with retention can be arranged to support this construct. With box shield classifications, if labeling content in your environment based on its sensitivity is an important use case, consider organizing your content, keeping in mind the ability to apply cascading classifications at the folder level, which then applies that same classification label to all underlying folders and files. Note that cascaded classifications are unique and that you can break the policy at the folder or file level as needed. So take, for example, Take the example on the right-hand side where you'll see I have a marketing folder for my organization that includes subfolders for campaigns and uh, sales enablement materials. The majority of campaign materials are meant to be kept internally, so I've applied my internal classification label as a cascaded policy on the campaigns folder. That then applies to all underlying content, including my television uh, subfolder, as well as all folders within that structure. But you'll notice TV for vendors is confidential. So in that location where I know there's more confidential and sensitive information, I've updated that cascaded classification label to be confidential instead. With Box Shield, you can then define classification-based access policies to restrict a user's scope of access, including restrictions on shared links, external collaboration, download and application access. So it's important to keep in mind that the organization and application of classifications can really help apply those security controls at scale. So finally, design a structure with access and permissions in mind to ensure the user experience is aligned to those security requirements that are so critical to your business. As Milo mentioned, the spotlights on usability, scale, and security and compliance that we just went over don't encompass all design concepts that should be considered nor may be most critical to your organization, but we hope that they showcase how design should meet varying user needs. So what should you do next? Thinking back to that three-step methodology, first, we recommend meeting with your stakeholders and establishing a Box Champions network. These individuals should be close to the use cases that are intended for Box and can be a source of feedback representing the end user's perspective throughout the implementation process. During step two, ask those discovery questions that we mentioned and any others that may be applicable and gather and document end user requirements that are specific to those identified use cases. And then finally, prototype and test your solution and consider that information gathered uh, when creating your ultimate final design. We recommend socializing that design with your stakeholders and, and going through a few iterations based on the feedback received until you reach an agreement and can move forward with the deployment of that folder structure. Now, once you have your folder structure design, you know, you can put that into box, but you also have to think about the critical aspect, which is to plan um, the implementation correctly to mitigate risk and drive user adoption. You can build it, but you need to make sure that users are using what you've put in place. So understanding that users have general resistance to change, it's important to obtain adequate sponsorship define clear messaging and support that transition through appropriate training or key resources that you can put together um, that address those possible barriers that may diminish benefits and reduce your ROI. So know that you are not alone in this journey and that help is available through Box Consulting. 
And we've helped over 10,000 customers use Box better. We can help take the more analytical approach to understanding your current state, creating your dream state folder structure, considering some of the concepts shared today, and building it for your prioritized use cases, going beyond just the basics, and finding something that will work and drive you to faster success. And if this is of interest, please visit the link below, blog.box.com forward slash with Box Consulting to learn more. So back to the statement I said at the start, and not the one about soccer. Airports are a lot like Box. There are different types of users, like families, business travelers, employees, for example, and there are different points of access, taxis, trains, other flights. And all of these users, all of these people in an airport need to be able to find what they need as seamlessly as possible. And this relates so much to Box. If you're able to develop a good folder structure and communicate the information strategy we spoke about earlier and incorporate that change management and everything that we've spoken about today, it's like being in an airport with an interactive map, having global entry, you're able to get to where you need easily and faster and more efficiently. Thank you, Milo. We'll now move into our customer spotlight with BTS. We'd like to give a warm welcome to Ranjit Pukatel from BTS. He is the IT director, and we want to thank him so much for joining us today. Ranjit, um, if you don't mind, could you start with your background at BTS? Thanks, Ellie. Um, yes, I started uh, in BTS in 1998. Um, my background was, uh, at the time of joining BTS, I was a uh, systems analyst, a software architect. A um, lot of uh, experience in those areas, but also with a lot of experience in network design and implementations. Um, started at BTS as a developer. We were just about 40 employees in three countries at that time, very small. Um, and they did not have a dedicated IT person at that time. So I gradually trans transitioned to my other strength, which is the, uh, as a, you know, as a network engineer. Amazing. Can you give us more insight on what BTS does as an organization? Sure. Uh, you yeah. know, our tagline says it all. It says making strategy personal. So we focus on the people side of strategy. Uh, we do this by designing, you could say, fun, powerful experiences. Uh, we don't just call it training. These are experiences which uh, the individual goes through. And what, when they go through these experiences, they understand how their day-to-day -day work impacts the company's uh, strategy. Uh, typically, these are workshops, but in today's world, we've been doing a lot of these experiences virtually. Great. And what are some of the biggest priorities as a, as a, for BTS as a company this year? So, you know, I think the biggest priority is keeping the business moving forward while keeping our people safe this year. Uh, I think that's a big thing for most companies, for BTS especially. Um, we are partnering with all our clients to make the experiences we normal deliver, normally deliver in person. We are partnering with them to make it 100% virtual um, at no additional cost to them and while still trying to keep it as rich as possible as an in-person experience. And in terms of those experiences, what does success look like, um, you know, making those transitions over to virtual? So, you know, for us, I think we always look at it this way. When a participant comes out of a BTS workshop and say something like, oh, I've learned so much more about how my work contributes to the success of my company from this one workshop rather than all from all these years I've been working here. You know, so I think that is like a, that, that tells us that we've been very successful. So in terms of, uh, cloud content management, what made you decide to look at Box as part of your core IT stack and what were you using before? So, you know, previously our data was in servers in multiple countries with teams were scattered in different regions and countries. Um, and you had, uh, it was very difficult for these teams to collaborate, especially when we had client engagements, which covered, um, you know, a multinational client engagements. Um, so we wanted a solution which would simplify the sharing by creating one in one, from one centralized location uh, and while still keeping in mind all the security needs and requirements. And I think uh, Box gave all of this for us. Perfect, and it sounds like those requirements are ever more important nowadays as well. Yeah, yeah in, terms especially of the, in terms of those security requirements, um, can you tell us a bit more about what they were and how you're trying to make them available to Box? Um, 
I think uh, for us, the primary thing, uh, driving factor was sharing with customers, you know, and uh, so when we first uh, started the, the process of migrating, we, we had to think about uh, the pros and cons of external collaboration. I mean, we see a big benefit uh, in sharing, but we also had to keep the part about keeping the data confidential in mind. So we had to keep that balance of the ease of sharing with the importance of keeping data confidential at the same time. Yeah, and I think that's something we always we always talk to customers about is finding that balance between security and collaboration to make sure you're not impacting user experience, but still you know, securing your content as much as possible. Right. Is there an example you can share about those low level settings and how they were used to enforce your security requirements? Um, we allow external collaboration within our box instance, which is critical for sharing project materials with our clients. Um, however, in select circumstances like when drafting an RFP for a new client, it's important to limit access to within BTS. Um, at the folder level, we can uh, downscope global settings, uh, such as the ability to collaborate externally and feel assured um, the content within uh, that structure remains internal and is not subject to accidental leakage with um, external parties. Okay, it seems like a, a great use of the, the classifications there. And can you talk us through a bit more about the process and how you define the underlying structure for those folders? So what we did is um, we met with the uh, business stakeholders and considered like uh, key user personas when identifying the underlying structure with each root level folder. Uh, we ensured that the underlying structure would be scalable over time uh, by organizing the client folders by industry, year, et cetera. Amazing. Um, one of the most important things undoubtedly is, is change management in an implementation like this. Um, how did you communicate this content management structure in Box with your end users? So um, we provisioned each user with a personal folder so that they had a workspace to freely upload and edit work-related content before it needs to be shared with their colleagues or external parties. Uh, with, within that personal folder, we included bookmark links to uh, get started with Box folder, which contain all the training materials and best practice guides. Um, so we use this uh, folder to push any announcements or updates in policy. Uh, we also post regular lunch and learns, um, you know, for reinforcements of these guidelines. Uh, plus we use, uh, you know, other media like Slack to extensively communicate uh, a lot of this to our end users. Perfect. And looking back on uh, the implementation, are there any features that have recently been released or released since the implementation that you wish you had when rolling out? Sure, I would say uh, for us, um, box collections and metadata have been a really useful. Box collections is something a lot of our users have been uh, looking forward to. And I think uh, these things would really help going forward. Yeah, 100% agree. I've been a, a frequent user of collections ever since they rolled out. They're a super useful tool for organizing your content. Well, thanks, Ranjit, for, for sharing your kind of cloud content management journey. Is there anything in, in BTS's next phase of digital transformation? What are some of those key projects coming down the pipeline that you, know, you can share with us today? Sure. Um, we, we are looking closely at Box Shield and to see how it will supplement the security. Um, as I said before, we, we, we've been we did all of our security based on data classification, but Box Shield is going to go a long way uh, to monitor that um, you know how people are using Box today. Um, and we also look at using a SIM solution. Uh, we use a third-party SIM solution which integrates with um, a Box uh, to monitor the logs and flag any kind of um, uh, any kind of like issues uh, and rapidly bring it to the notice of our SOC team. That's great. Yeah, those work really closely together. So hopefully um, we can get you on Box Shield and, and get those alerts being pushed over to your SIM tool and have that seamless experience that you're looking for. Um, before we close out, do you have any last pieces of advice to those listening on how they can build a successful folder structure or some lessons learned that you'd like to kind of pass along? The only piece of advice I would give um, is to be flexible. Uh, you know, regardless of, you cannot be too rigid with your folder structure. Uh, things evolve, things change, and you need to be 
open to understanding the changes in the business and adapt and modify your folder structure accordingly. You cannot be like, okay, this is it and it doesn't change. You need to be open to change. I think that's a great piece of advice to close out. Uh, well, Ranjit, we thank you so much for sharing BTS's journey on Box. Um, I know I speak on behalf of all those listening that your insight was truly enlightening. Uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you for having me, Ellie and Milo. Milo, it looks like we have some questions from the audience. Let's take some time to answer a few while we're on the call. Um, so the first one here is, how should I approach moving from a legacy structure to a new structure in Box? Can you take that one? Sure. So I think there are a couple of approaches that you can take. Um, we have a, a recommended one, but there's also an alternative one if you want to do it. The recommended one really is to tidy up things in the source instance first. So if you have it on a uh, network file share, for example, and you're wanting to move out to Box, tidy up on the source instance first. Make sure the, the content that you want um, is ready to go into Box. Um, we also see customers do a, a transition period where they'll essentially mark, you know, they'll do the migration and then they'll mark that um, original source as read only. And that essentially allows people to access content they need just in case maybe we haven't finished with the migration yet, um, but it prevents people from adding new content and, you know, making things a bit harder when we actually do the full migration. Uh, the alternative is to move the folder structure to box and maybe designate some content leads to perform those cleanups, but it's probably the recommended one to do the previous one. In terms of identifying the content, typically we'd look at three things. We'd look at uh, redundant content, that's content that is uh, duplicative. Um, if you, know, you understand that there's uh, lots of different teams creating lots of the same content, there may be ways to streamline it and, and consolidate that work. There's also obsolete content. So this is content that is um, outdated, content that is, um, you know, maybe hasn't been accessed in a while. And then you have trivial content, which is content that is really no longer relevant to the business, something that is relevant for potentially a previous strategy or for a previous um, business unit. Um, those are the three things that you should be targeting when looking at content and, and some of those things around access and, you know, uh, when it was last created, they're kind of quick wins in terms of identifying content that can be removed. Got it. So really streamlining kind of your existing content and making sure that you're only bringing into box what's most relevant. Exactly. Yeah. There's a question here um, for you, Haley. So what is the biggest snag customers run into when designing their folder structure? It's a great question. I, I would call out a few different points. Um, so kind of first is not designing to, with their use cases in mind. And I think this goes back to all that we've discussed today. You know, we encourage following that three-step methodology that we've outlined to decrease that likelihood that this would occur. Um, but it is some, some, uh, a bit of a snag that we see customers encounter. Um, another big decision that, you know, customers will have to make is whether or not they want individual users to have the ability to create content at their root level or all files page. Um, you may have heard of this being referred to as open versus closed structure. Um, but that decision is kind of, a, um, you know, a fork in the road that customers need to kind of face and, and understand based on their on their security needs and their compliance needs, you know, which direction that they want to go. Um, also, I'd encourage customers to run periodic reviews of content or use retention policies to remove content that's no longer relevant or required. So kind of getting rid of what's necessary, similar to your point in the previous question. Um, also, box storage is unlimited. So the more you store, the more difficult it's going to be for users to find content. So find that happy medium where, um, you know, you're taking advantage of the unlimited storage, but you're not overwhelming with just um, excessive amounts of content in box. And then finally, and I, I think this is true for any engagement, whether it be folder structure or just general onboarding on the box, change management and enablement is super critical. Um, so you may think something's intuitive to your end users, but with change management best practices, you can control that messaging around Box's value proposition for your organization and, and clearly define when Box should be used in comparison to other tools in your, in your IT, IT stack. So obviously quite a few snags that customers encounter, but nothing that you can't overcome and, and um, have solutions for. Um, so there is, uh, I see a question here about data residency re requirements and how to incorporate that into your design. Milo, could you speak to that a bit? Sure, yeah. So 
Um, Box multi zones is, is one of our products. I'm assuming this is um, what the, the person is talking about. So multi zones essentially allows you to store content in different locations. Um, so if you have you know legal jurisdictions that, that mandate that you store certain content in certain regions, then Box multi zones helps with that. Um, location for multi zones in terms of where the content is stored is based on ownership. So really, the recommendation to, to sort this out would be to um, if you have multi zones, split out those service accounts and have them uh, kind of owning their own content based on the region. So you could just have you know, service account dash EMEA owning the legal EMEA folder. Um, you could have service account US owning the, the legal US one, for example. But um, separating those, those content owners out to in, ensure that you're essentially storing them in different locations really helps. And I think in terms of box governance as well, which is one of other products, um, it's not really related to residency per se, but it's understanding the different um you know compliance needs that are uh, um you know the, the, the you as have as a customer um and applying retention policies based on those um requirements so you know splitting out uh, folders even further if you need to store them for, for seven years for example or for 10 years um, just making sure you're understanding if there are different requirements based on the region and map and mapping those and matching those to the multi-zones ones as well great um, question for you, Haley, um, and this is, I guess, more of a question from me. Um, what box feature can help users manage their, their personal contents pool and findability concerns? This might be a plug. <laughs> yeah, I, I see right through you. Yeah, we've recently introduced a, a new box web UI that includes box collections. Um, box collections enables users to create and name private collections of content in their box account. Um, what's great about collections and why I use them is that they're not shared with anyone and they're only visible to myself. And that's true for any user that creates their own collections, which is great. So you can really have a customized experience within Box um, and organize content without disrupting the actual structure of that information within your environment. Um, so for example, I'm a project manager. My project folders exist in kind of one larger folder tree. So I really just want to isolate those project folders that I'm familiar with and I use day to day. So I created a collection that I named my projects and um, I've even updated my homepage to land on my collections view versus all files so that I can easily access and streamline my day to get to the information I need. So that's a really great way, a new box feature um, that's really allowing end users to take some of that customization without disrupting again that that original structure and box and, and making their experience their own. Awesome. Great. So I think that does it for questions. I think we're uh, out of time. Doesn't mean you should stop asking questions in the chat, um, but that um, we do want to extend kind of our sincere thanks to each of you for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everyone.